Looky here with Carmen Legg. Well, looky here. We're back in Chester, and we're again talking with Danny Henniger. And in this segment, we're going to be talking about the folklore and ghost of uh, Oak Island. So is there any myth surrounding ghosts that might be guarding Oak Island? Absolutely none. Oh my God, Cameron, there's dozens of them. Really? Dozens of stories. Yeah. Really? Um, right up to current time, going right back into the old, the old days sort of thing. So there's been all sorts of supernatural stories, ghost stories, noises, unexplained noises, any, uh, any, apparitions. Any happened to you personally? To me personally, no, because I'm one of those guys that looks for it, so I don't think I'm ever going to oh, see it. Oh, it's all right, me too. But I'll tell you one I was involved with as a tour guide in Oak Island, because I was a tour guide from 73 to 75. Um, a great high school job, best job I ever had, but the worst pay. It was just terrible pay. But anyway, what they used to do, they put tour guides in different places on the island, station you, and the tourists would walk to you. Oh, and then okay, you yeah. send them back off the island sort of So deal. they'd be, uh, come through in groups? Yeah. Okay. yeah, or sometimes just one person, it depends, because people come there by themselves, and sometimes we marshal them up into a group. But if you came to Oak Island in 1974 and wanted a tour, you paid your buck and a quarter, and out to the island you went. Okay. And you would encounter guys like me and girls too. There's a good mix of tour guides there at the time. And um, we'd uh, explain the stories to you. So this one day... This was offered by the government? Or? That's right, provincial government. The provincial department of tourism decided that there should be tours of Oak Island, which uh, was a great idea. I wish there was tours today, but there isn't. And Not yet. You no. never know if there's going to be. But anyway, uh, back at that time, that's the way it worked. And, um, you know, I was paid by the provincial government, which is a fantastic thing for a little boy, a little fat boy in school who uh, could make a good dollar so I could buy beer and, and entertain mm -hmm. the ladies on the weekend. <laughs> So, so there's lots of stories. This is the one story that I remember is the strongest memory in my mind. Um, me and another tour guide were uh, stationed at this one spot near the ox pen because we had an ox pen there with a bunch of oxen into it so people could see what oxen looked like. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, it's called the ox pen. And that's where the road forked. So you get down this way to Fred Nolan's and we used to take people around Fred Nolan's and up around that way. Then you come back around on this road, which is called the South Shore Road. That's the road everybody goes down now because of the fight that happened between Fred and Dan and the Triton Alliance, but that's sort of over with now. But anyway, I digress. So we're sitting there, and we knew there was still a guy on the island, so we're looking at our watches, looking at our watches. Finally, we saw the guy coming up from the South Shore Road. He was just a bath of sweat. He was all nerved up, and he said, um, he said, are you okay? And he said, listen, I just had a really weird experience. So he said, well, you know, what happened? He said he was walking along. It was a nice day, a warm, a warm day. And later on in the afternoon, probably late, I'd suggest around 4 o'clock, something like that. And he said he was walking through the woods on the, on the trail, on the road. And all of a sudden, he stepped from where it was really, really warm into really, really cold. And then he's able to step back in the warm step back in the cold. And at one point, he's able to have it so that half his body was warm, half his body was cold. And that really freaked him out. And all of a sudden, he said he started getting these feelings of foreboding and he's being watched or he just started to freak out. And when we saw him, he was hightailing it up the road towards us and we got the story from him. And he beat it down the center of the road to go back to his car. And the guides that were still at the ticket booth told us that when he left the island, he booted it over there. He didn't waste any time. And his eyes were like this. They're like saucers. So my buddy and I decided, let's run down to see this. So we beat it down the South Shore Road to see what it was. Nothing. Just warm woods, birds chirping, that sort of thing. You hear the ocean off in the background. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Many, many years later, I think around about 2007, 2008, I was giving a tour of Oak Island for the Oak Island Tourism Society. And amongst our group was a, a lady who was a school teacher in a local school. And we were walking along, talking sort of thing. We are at the end of the group. Everybody used to go ahead of us. We had to be very careful to get people off the island. Dan was very, very nervous about fires, and rightfully so. So we had to make sure that everybody was off that island and nobody was smoking. Mm -hmm. So anyway, 
I was walking with this woman. She is the last um, in the group, a few people with us. My wife was with us and we were walking and she said, oh my goodness, I'm cold. And it was a hot day. I could feel the sweat coming down off my temples was running down my back. I was tired and everything else. And I thought, cold? You're crazy. It's not cold here. It's hot. And then she said how hot she was. And all of a sudden I thought back 30, 40 years. I thought, oh yeah. my God. Same spot. It's in the same spot. I swear to God. And as we're walking along, she is kind of a big lady. And, you know, I, I started thinking of practical thoughts. I thought, you've been walking a lot. Are you having a heart attack? Um, so having been a, a first responder at one time as a police officer a long, long time ago, um, with my, well, I didn't have the training then, but I understood things. So I said, can I put my hands on your, on your arm? And I put my hand on her arm, Carmen, it was cold. You could see the goosebumps running right up her arm. Right? And I thought, oh my God, she is cold. And as we kept walking along, I kept waiting for her to collapse, like the fall to the ground sort of thing. She didn't. She carried herself off the island, no problem. But this resonated in my mind after all those years. This woman in the same place on the island had the same experience as other guy. And of course, I never felt a thing other than just pure hot. So in this spot that she felt cold, you didn't? Nope. You still felt hot? Oh, hot, yes. Yeah, sweat just running off me. Exactly. Miserable. Wow. I couldn't wait to get home to have a shower. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it was that bad. But Oak Island's got all sorts of stories like that. Did she say anything more about what she felt or saw? She just, I don't remember her saying she saw anything, just the feeling exactly. of being really, really cold. And like I said, you could see the goosebumps right up her arm. And when I put my hand on her arm, my wife was there, so I wasn't being fresh. I put my hand on her arm with her permission, and I could feel it. I thought, oh my God, she is cold. And I'm this hot, and everybody else was hot too, but she she was cold. Could have been coincidence. You know? Oh, who knows? But the thing who is, knows? it was in the same spot. Yeah, as yeah. before. Yeah. It struck me as very unusual, and of course, I remember to this very day. And at that time, in 2007, I guess it was, I had already had my police experience. So I knew sometimes people would lie to you, people would tell you stories and try and impress you. But this woman wasn't. She was genuine, and like I said, I felt her, felt her arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just one of dozens of stories about Oak Island. Um, another one with Jim Kaiser. Jim Kaiser worked for the Restalls um, in, uh, in the 1960s. And of course, after the Restalls passed away, well, actually, I'll reel the tape back a little bit. Jim helped recover some of the bodies. I, th I thought he was one of the rescuers. Yeah, he was. Not a rescuer, a recoverer. Oh, By that oh, time, see, everybody was drowned. And uh, what the fire department was going to do because of the gases at the bottom of the shaft, they were going to lower down hooks and hook the men and pull them up. Okay. And uh, Jim said, nope. You're not doing that to the rest stalls. Uh, they are really good to me. I uh, felt very strongly about them. I'll go down and recover the bodies. So Jim went down the shaft with a rope tied around his waist and uh, tied the rope around uh, Robert Restall, Bobby Restall, Cyril Hiltz, and, they, and Carl Gracer, and they pulled the bodies out that way. And that way Jim was happy they didn't have hook holes in them where they hooked them to the hall. It's, it's a nasty thing to think about, but it's a practical thing for practical people. Mm -hmm. That's how you recover bodies. The same as dragging a, a hook through the water. Somebody drowns in the lake, you drag a hook until you hook them, and then you bring them up to the service. Not pretty, but it's just the way it works. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Jim went home after that. He was traumatized by the whole thing, and apparently he had nightmares after that. But one time he was hired to um, work as a, a night watchman and he stayed in the rest all cabin and at some point in the middle of the night the cabin started shaking and he said he felt a pressure on his chest like somebody was pushing him down with his chest and the next day he was covered in bruises Really? and uh, his wife um, Beulah, Beulah Kaiser, I went to interview her one time before she passed away because she would have the original story. She said that on Jim's arm there's one place where you could see fingerprints where it looked like something had grabbed them and left marks of his, their fingers, its fingers behind. Mm -hmm. Jim died a very troubled man and uh, his death was not pretty. 
Uh, I know his family, all of his boys. He had a lot of boys. He had all boys, and I know them very well. And uh, they remember some of these stories. They know how their dad was uh, tortured by Oak Island and uh, his memory. And Jim was a Mi'kmaq man, and Mi'kmaq people often have a, a stronger sense of um, presence around them, whatever have you. I don't really know how to explain it, but they're, they have a deeper understanding of things perhaps us white people do because of the way we were brought up, the way they were brought up. But anyway, uh, Jim did not have a, a good ending. And um, it started, I think, with Oak Island. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, yeah, Jim was a, an entrepreneur. He had his own truck at that time before he recovered the bodies. But anyway, that's the story with Jim Kaiser. And it's, um, it's as true as you can tell a story. Mm. Other stories would have, like most recently, I know that some of the people with Prometheus Entertainment, some of the cameramen and people that worked on the show saw apparitions. They saw like a, dis, a body with no legs moving up the South Shore Road. And they just poof, disappear. Is that? Yep. I've been on the island several times. I haven't felt nothing. Oh, nothing. I've been, I've stayed overnight in Oak Island. I've camped out there. Again, looking for apparitions, looking for noises. The rest stalls heard noises too. But what they ration, rationalized it to be was um, tunnels collapsing underground oh, because exactly. all of a sudden there'd be a big woof mm -hmm. and they go, there was nothing. And then, um, you know, rest all might say, oh, it was uh, one of the old tunnels collapsing, one of the old Halifax oh, right, tunnels. Right. But um, back in this, the 2000s, uh, the Oak Island Tourism Society contracted the services of a, a psychic. Her name was Eugenia Macer's Story. So we brought, the, she was from New York State, so we brought her up here for Explore Oak Island Days to give us um, her impressions around the money pit evening, uh, one evening. So before she uh, did that, uh, we had a nice little setup for her. We had candles set up. She was dressed in black robes. It was all very nice looking. Um, so the, earlier that day, she wanted to do some readings around the Oak, around Oak Island, get some recordings, take pictures and stuff like that. So my wife took care of her while I was doing something else because we worked like dogs trying to put Explore Oak Island days together. So while Yvonne was touring um, her around Oak Island, they went up around the ox pen again, and uh, she tried to do some recordings. The recorder wouldn't work. But when she got off the island, the recorder worked. So this sort of thing has plagued uh, a lot of people over the years. Yeah, me Island. too. Yeah. You too? Yes, I was on there early one morning for filming, had my cell phone with me, uh, I made a call before I got to the island, phone worked perfect. Mm. But while I was on the island, I couldn't get my uh, cell phone to work at all. <laughs> as soon as I left the island, of course, I had service again. Yeah, yeah. Bizarre things. Another story talks about um, crows flying over to Oak Island and uh, watching what was going on. Personally, I have a, a personal story to tell about that, that I think this is what the crow is all about. Uh, when I worked in construction work over in Western Shore, there used to be a crow that visited us all the time. His name is Cecil. And Cecil the crow was a really friendly crow. And he would land on a big pile of ground and he'd be watching me and Mike down in the ditch working with our picks and shovels sort of thing and squawking now and then. He was that friendly. You could actually walk up to him. And one day I took off my wristwatch and it was a big heavy diver's watch with a big metal strap onto it. And I thought, I'm going to put it in front of Cecil, see what he thinks of it. Jeez, he grabbed it and I thought he was going to fly away. Oh. So I quick grabbed my watch and got it back from him. But treasure hunters have said that there's crows that would sit in the trees or on the bank and watch them. Oh, okay. I can't help but wonder if it was Cecil. Yeah, it could have been. could have been. But then again, you know, if it was back in the 50s or even the 60s when it happened, Cecil didn't live that long. No, not sure. Yeah. So it may not so, have been so Cecil. So the, uh, the woman psychic, did she see anything? No, no. I was hoping that uh, the evening um, that we had everybody, I gave everybody a tour of Oak Island, and the end of it was they were going to listen to Eugenia's impressions of what she was getting from Oak Island. And she didn't get anything. She said, I'd, I'm not really getting anybody who wants to talk through me or talk with me or anything like that. And I personally felt it uh, spoke to her legitimacy, mm -hmm. that she wasn't putting on a show trying to impress us with all sorts of stories about people maybe buried down on the ground or something like that. So she wasn't getting much, and I thought, well, 
from what I understand from the supernatural world, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yes, sir, it's yeah. not always on. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. And then there's the stories about dogs with glowing red eyes. There's supposed to be dogs running around and all kind of glowing red eyes and they stand there and stare at you and snarl and disappear sort of thing. How so, did the... So lots of stories over the years. How did the residents of the mainland view Oak Island? Did they, <laughs> did, was some, it so some very positively, some not so much. Um, well, there's a lot of people that simply don't believe in the supernatural. They think it's all a bunch of nonsense. Uh, then there's people who really believe into it. And then there's people like me who are wanting to understand, want to do it, want to believe it, want to see something you never do, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. uh, and local people were just exactly that, a good combination of some believe, some didn't believe, some wanted to believe. Mm -hmm. But Lunenburg County, well, m actually most of Nova Scotia at one time, the folklore is very heavy, talking about poltergeists, um, forerunners, ghosts of all descriptions sort of thing and a forerunner is just something like a you and i baby sitting here and all of a sudden we hear hmm. what was that yeah that's right yeah. well that's a forerunner it's right, um, right, telling right. you something's going to happen right. uh, any treasure hunter on the we'll say the show shore of nova scotia knows that treasure will not be revealed if you say something. If you can't say one speak. word. Can't speak, it'll drop down. If you can't speak, that's right. it'll disappear. Yeah, and there's another story that goes that uh, what the, the pirates especially would do, I don't know if it was true or not, I don't think it was true. Um, they, would take a, they would take a black man and kill him and leave him with the treasure. But the funny thing about that is, and not funny, but the, the knowledgeable thing about that is, if you were a black man, and I was a white man, I was the captain of a pirate ship, I'd welcome you as my brother. You were a pirate, and you had equal share with everything. If you lost an arm, we'd give you money. So at that time, if you were a black man working with a, a white crew, they treat you just fine. Mm -hmm. It's not like the, it turned out to be in other places where if you were a person of color, they wouldn't treat you very right. well. But, but pirates are a little bit different story. That's right. But Except was, for the killing part. That's right. But I don't it, know if that was true or not. Well, it was, it was a common story that yep, any common treasure story. buried, somebody had to be killed to guard it. That's right. That's right. And oftentimes there were. I know of one story on the south shore, actually it was on the western shore. Uh, there was four men digging in, along the beach. And it was late at night, totally dark. Yeah. And they realized there was five in the hole digging. Oh my goodness. And one said, again, he said a word, he said, who's that? Boom. They were in water up to their necks, just like that. <laughs> That's the type of stories I've heard. I know of a treasure hunt that occurred in a lake, not too far from Oak Island one time, where the men were looking for a treasure that was allegedly put there by a member of the Vaughn family. And they got such a feeling of foreboding, they had to run away from the lake. They just freaked right out. So this is mm. all just all part of this mm. whole. And I know um, another one of these guys actually saw a person walk across the road and disappear up into the woods, and there was no person there. No, but they saw an apparition. That's a common thing. Yes, yes it is. Yes, it is yes, common amongst these common stories. Thing. Yeah. Also, uh, maybe not quite as common as that, but you hear about it every now and then. That if you want treasure to reveal itself. You've got to yoke a team of chickens. <laughs> I've never heard that one before. You yoke a team of chickens. Yoke a team of chickens. Yes, the treasure will be revealed. Oh my goodness gracious. I so there you go. If you and I ever go treasure hunting, which we've already done, if you and I ever go treasure hunting again, we'll have to bring chickens and harnesses with us. That's with right. Us. That's right. That'll be an interesting. And don't say anything if you see it. That's right. You can't say nothing. Oh. Well, again, thank you, Daniel. Oh, my very absolute, interesting stories. Yeah. My absolute pleasure. Very good. Thank you.